Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us again for the Dare Dallas webinar. We all hope you've had a fantastic summer. We certainly have, and I, uh, looking at the weather today, it looks like summer's actually over, but, but who knows? Hopefully there's a few weeks left somewhere, and hopefully some of you have managed to, to get away to somewhere nice and exotic for the summer. Now, obviously, we've had a little bit of a break, um, and hopefully you've all enjoyed our one-to-one -one interviews with the specialists that we have here at Dare Dallas, and you've enjoyed some of the information that they've been giving out. Um, but we're actually back to our regular schedule now. And we're going to try and do some really interesting webinars over the coming, uh, coming month rather. So please do give us a call or drop us an email if there's anything that you'd like to be covered in those. Now, today I'm joined by one of my favourite values, Aurelia Turrell. So thank you ever so much for joining us today, Aurelia. Good morning, Alistair. Hi. And the subject that we're going to be covering today is the Crown Jewels. Now, often People talk about the crown jewels and people assume it's a crown, it's, it's, it's a tiara, it's, it's just one or two items. But obviously there's, there's far more to it. And hopefully today in the webinar that we're putting out today, we'll, uh, we'll know a little bit more about it. So good morning, Aurelia. Lovely to see you. And uh, where do we start with the crown jewels? Well, I think it's important to define what the crown jewels are. So uh, essentially they comprised of heirlooms and uh, jewels presented to the queen during her, her reign. Um, and they belong to the queen in right of the crown. So she wears them um, in official portraits and formal occasions, and then they're passed down to her heirs. Um, I'm going to go back to Henry VIII um, because that's really where we start to, to see all the, the purchases and, um, uh, and biggest, bigger pieces that were uh, then added to the crown jewels. Um, so we start with the, the Henry VIII, um, who's usually presented in portraits with um, some very dark stones uh, in his portraits, but those are actually diamonds. But um, at the time, uh, the painter would start the painting and then the um, the studio, if you like, would finish it, but they didn't have access to the stones. So they didn't really know um, how to depict the, the the color of diamonds. So they're usually portrayed quite black. Um, oh gosh, so, so these actually weren't done in, in situ. They were something that was kind of imagined by the, uh, the portrait artists and were actually almost stuck on later. Later, yeah, exactly. So started in situ and then finished off by somebody else uh, in a in a like, studio. <laughs> um, but the, but but every monarch is always presented with diamonds um, because they symbolise power and wealth, and um, uh, and and you'll always see um, monarchs with them, you know, head to toe covered in diamonds. Um, we can see there's a portrait of Queen Elizabeth the uh, first as well. In this portrait of Queen Elizabeth the first, we can see she is wearing a lot of gold and uh, what is actually diamonds throughout uh, in her hair and on her garments. It's it's she's literally covered head to toe in in jewels uh, and diamonds in in particular. So again, not um, a lot of color in those diamonds, but. That was for the same reason as, as for the, the, the portrait of Henry VIII, quite dark um, colours there, but it didn't mean that they were black stones. Okay, now I noticed with this one, Aurelia, we, we were talking about the fact that there are lots of diamonds and, and stones within the clothing and within her garment. Was that a normal thing? I mean, would they have been incredibly good quality stones as well? So no, I don't think we can say that they were wonderful quality. Um, they also didn't have the, the perfect knowledge and tools to cut them in such a manner that it would reflect the colour um, as well as it does today, because it's all a question of angles and, um, and the way the light refracts within the stone. Um, and also at the time, diamonds were cut to reflect as many colours as possible with incandescent light. So the cuts back then will be really very different from what we can find today uh, and mostly due to technology. Okay right so I think we'll move on to now Aurelia um, kind of a more modern kind of style shall we say and things that are obviously slightly better recorded because of later types of photography and, and various other things but what can you tell us about obviously this lady here and obviously a, a, a fairly tremendous brooch there. 
Yeah, so this is a portrait of uh, Queen Victoria. Um, and in this portrait, she is wearing one of the most famous uh, jewels, the Kono, um, and she's wearing it as a brooch in this portrait. So this, uh, this stone was um, presented to the Queen um, by the Kingdom of Punjab in 1849, and it, it means the Mountain of Light. Um, it weighed approximately 186 carats, and it was said to bring bad luck to any man who wears it, but there was no mention of bringing bad luck to a woman. So therefore, Queen uh, Victoria <laughs> ended up wearing that yeah, lovely- is, is there any record of, of, of any men wearing it who succumbed to its curses? Or yeah, anything? yes, there, was, there were a few deaths, <laughs> hence oh, the, the, the saying that it would just bring bad luck to any man who wears it. Um, it was presented actually in 1851 at the Great Exhibition in London, um, but the public didn't really take to it. So Prince Albert uh, ordered for it to be recut and it, it lost quite a bit of uh, weight to it and it then ended up wearing just over 105 carats, which is still a very reasonable size. I was going to say, that's still, that's still not something you could have a pair of as earrings, is it? They're quite heavy. <laughs> Um, later on, it was actually um, mounted in a tiara in 1853 by Garrett and Company. Um, it was um, it was so set in a, in a tiara for uh, Queen um, Alexandra in 1901, um, and we have a portrait of her um, wearing that 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 stone uh, in her crown. So there we go there, you should be able to see that one now. So yeah. when, when these crowns were made, uh, one, one, one presumes that they were done to a certain specification or a certain kind of style that the current monarch wanted, or was it something that was decided by a council or anything along those lines? It, it's mostly the design of uh, Garrard. I mean, there were requirements from the monarchs to have the stone set in a particular um, area of the crown or, or, or with certain motifs, but it's mostly the design of uh, Garrard in, in, this, um, in this occasion. Um, and we'll see, we'll see throughout history that they constantly had um, their own design and their own finesse brought to the, to the jewels. And um, they, um, the same company again, Garrard, who then uh, later set the, the stone in, um, in the Queen Mary's crown in 1911, and then passed on to uh, Queen Elizabeth's crown in 1937 for her coronation as Queen Consort. And so there we go, a slightly more modern incarnation of that crown. So, so what were you saying about this one, Aurelia? Um, so again, it was reset uh, by Garrard to slightly change the look of it, if you like. Um, and here it is at the finished product in Queen Mary's crown in 1911. And we can actually also see that she, um, she's wearing a, a heavy brooch in the centre um, and she's wearing the Kalinin, two of the Kalinin diamonds. Which is another webinar that we'll actually come on to later uh, on. in the near future. But in terms of all the other accoutrements that went through it, obviously there's pearls, there's more stones. Are these things that are generally kind of kept as uh, a standard thing, or are they things that are maybe gifted to the royal family of this? It, it's safe to assume, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later, obviously that these, these, these treasures, these royal jewels, are, are handed down from generation to generation. But one assumes that the monarch will have some personal pieces that perhaps you know, she wears for, or he wears for certain events and that they just get passed down. She does, but she's she's allowed to do whatever she wants with those personal effects. Um, the rest she's not um, wouldn't be allowed to um, sell them or give them away. Certainly not. Um, it has to be really passed down to the next generation or gifted um, to another monarch or, or her heirs. Um, and then we see that some jewels are contested throughout time, such as this uh, this uh, stone, the Corino, who's still to this day contested by um, uh, by several countries. In fact, um, uh, India has requested it was returned to them in 1953, which was the year of um, Queen Elizabeth II's coronation. She mm. wore it at her coronation. So there's there's a lot of history with all these um, with all these stones, and we can't. Um, they can't just be moved around as easily as... I, I think there will always be, unfortunately, some debate about this, though. So I think Pakistan have also had some kind of claim on it. And also uh, 
is it Indonesia or something like that that have had a claim on it because there happens to be the, the sister stone that kind of exists that they own as well. So I think as, as with many of the world's treasures, it's often of a debatable heritage, shall we say. Exactly, because it, it, it's said to have been presented to Queen Victoria, but under what circumstances? Because it was the annex of a certain part of, of the country. So a lot of a lot of history and, and debates but it's staying in the in in the um <laughs> amongst the crown jewels um let's, and it's set let's, now in the maltese crown <laughs> maltese let's, cross of the crown yeah less politics and more diamonds i think we should probably cover but just actually looking at that crown again obviously we've got maltese crosses and fleur-de-lis so does the fleur-de-lis within the crown still still represent that 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 french influence it does, and, and we'll see, it, 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 um, the monarchs went back and forth uh, having that style, as we'll see uh, just very shortly, that um, uh, it, it sometimes um, the monarchs had decided not to have anything to do with the French, and therefore there were no fleur de lis, and it was more um, roses and shamrocks to represent the country of Britain. Um, but in this case, we do still have the fleur de lis. <laughs> Good for some. Right, yeah. okay, let's, uh, let's move on to our next image. Now, here we have, obviously, the thing that we've been discussing a lot. Now, the, the ermine and, and, and velvet part of the crown, obviously, in some of these crowns, they don't have, and we'll move that on to a little bit later, but the stone in the centre, is that, is that the Koh-i-Noor that's there? That's it, that's the Koh-i-Noor set right at the centre of the crown, um, in all its glory and, and magnificence, really. Um, and it's, as far as I know, it's not going anywhere. It's not being altered. It's, it's staying as is in that crown. So is this the same crown that we saw in the previous image? Uh, where it's worn by, um, well, well, this one might have been altered a little bit because it is the one that um, Queen Elizabeth II wore for her coronation. So there may have been uh, a few alterations, but... I think the, one, the one that I think um, Princess uh, uh, Queen Mary okay. is wearing looks looks very similar, but obviously, exactly because I think they they did make them to be wearable and adaptable, didn't they? Exactly. They usually, uh, especially Queen Elizabeth, um, usually with some of her jewels, she's had stones removed or altered just to fit her her personal style and uh, and taste. So as we'll see later on, she she's done that for a few other items as well. Fantastic. Right, and we'll move on to our next image now. Um, and here we are with, let's talk about this one. This, this yeah, looks this... It's fairly, fairly hefty set, shall we say. And that looks like almost like a little floral sprigs around it. Would that be accurate? Sorry. Uh, so this one looks like it, it might have some form of like floral sprigs around it, kind of like with, with berries or something like that, as opposed to being a, a more traditional kind of either fleur de lis or something along those lines. What can you tell us about Exactly. So, so this one is the one where fleur de lis was not even a question. Um, it was a crown, the state diadem, which is commissioned by Prince George for his coronation. Um, at the time, he spent £243,000 um, mm. on his coronation, which is now the equivalent of almost £22 million. Um, uh, quite an extravagant uh, uh, procession with um, a silk with velvet and, and fur robe uh, with ostrich and heron feathers in, in his um, black cap. Um, and um, he, he, he commissioned this crown and it was rather quite small, 19 centimeters in diameter. And it's got over 1300 diamonds, um, uh, which weighed over 320 carats. So very, very hefty crown <laughs> in terms of diamonds. Um, and at the time, so he wanted no reminder of the French whatsoever. So the fleur de lis were not um, going to be present in this crown. And instead, he asked for roses, thistles, and shamrock to symbolize England, Scotland, and Ireland, and which gives us this uh, this design, which differs um, quite a lot from the usual uh, fleur de lis that we've seen in in other crowns. And we've also got these beautiful pearls and. I was going to comment on the pearls. I mean, you don't generally see a lot of pearls on crowns, do you? No, they're usually on garments um, sewn into, especially the ladies' uh, ladies' garment. Um, but this one has two rows of, of pearls, which are quite well matched. 
um, beautiful pearls. And then you have this central yellow diamond, which um, uh, weighs almost uh, four carats. It's really quite beautiful. Um, and it's at the time- stone, isn't it? Absolutely stunning stone. And it just gives that, you know, that, that centerpiece to it, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly, yeah, just beautiful. Um, and at the time it was a current practice to rent the stones, hire the stones rather than buying them because they were so costly. Um, so he- so where, where would they, where would, where would you, I mean, it's not something you find in the phone book, is it? Going, right, okay, I've got a coronation in six months time. I really need, need. to start thinking about where I'm gonna get my stones from. Can you give up, can you give my man Gerard a call and he'll sort out setting them? It's not something you would expect to hear, is it? No, exactly. You'd think they would have just open up the, the chest and pick a few pick a few diamonds to have set. But no, actually, at the time, uh, it, because it was so costly and so rare that um, only a few people had access to those stones. But um, at the time, Prince George was quite upset that his procession was so short between Westminster and Westminster Abbey, um, only a few hundred metres. And he thought, well, I didn't get to wear this ground enough. So he ended up buying it. Um, and not returning the the stone. So um, essentially, yes, that's a, <laughs> hence the, the the cost of the almost twenty two million pound um, uh, for for the whole the whole procession. Oh, the splendor of the Georgian days! I think one could say, really, isn't it? The, the, the precursor to everything that kind of came after it, isn't it? But yeah, fantastic! What a story as well. The fact okay. that he ended up buying it because he thought, you know what, I haven't worn it enough. <laughs> So I probably should have some more time with it. It doesn't matter if it costs me another million or so. There we go. What's a million? <laughs> well, exactly. Between friends, exactly. Yeah. So, we then, have... so then it was passed down um, to, to, to Queen Victoria and, then, and Queen Elizabeth II as well. And we can so see the next portrait. So it's still in the collection of the crown jewels. It is still in the collection. Um, and we have a, a portrait of Queen Elizabeth wearing it um, uh, amongst the pictures there. And it's the one also that's... Um, uh, worn by the crown, uh, sorry, worn by the queen um, on stamps and banknotes. And there we go, gosh. Isn't that incredible though, that it's actually, I mean, it's, it looks even more adept on her than it probably did on him. Yeah, well, you, could, you could hardly see it on him because he had so many feathers and a big cap, but this is, this is beautiful. And it's stunning, yeah, isn't it? Is. And as you say, it's, it's well known for being the one that's actually figured on what is the uh, and there it is on the stamp there it is Got and we can yeah. see we can see um no fleur de lis again and just the uh the the, the bouquet of, of roses and thistles and and all of those tremendous now obviously when we look at um queen elizabeth ii she she has a would you say a profound love of jewellery or, you know, does she acquire many new things or has she had a, a lot of kind of transformations with the crown jewels within her time? She, she has. Um, so she very much loves her jewels. Um, we, well, we see her with the beautiful brooches and, and things like that. And she does adapt some of the pieces. So uh, one of the most recognisable pieces uh, was the coronation necklace and earring that she wore at her coronation. And again, this was made by Gerard. Um, uh, and uh, it was made in 1858 uh, for the Queen's coronation and then passed down to Queen Alexandra and then and therefore uh, Queen Elizabeth. But she had it altered um, to 25 diamonds. Uh, Is this the, the, the Peru that we've got in front of us here? Exactly, there we did. Yeah. Um, so necklace and matching earrings, just all in diamonds. Um, and so she had it made smaller. Is that is that because it didn't didn't suit her her neckline, or was it because she wanted it to be? I was going to say because she wanted it to be less os ostentatious, but I don't think you really really could with that kind of thing, could you? But um, it, probably it's, it's, a better fit as well. I think um, uh, Queen Victoria was perhaps not quite the same build, uh, and therefore perhaps it just uh, fits Queen Elizabeth II uh, slightly better. Very polite. Very polite. Though. Now. We can't obviously, I think we, we seem to have bypassed um, Queen Victoria a little bit here, so, so we will go back. And obviously we've got um, a really good side-by-side -side image here of, of Victoria and of Queen Elizabeth II, obviously um, displaying the, the, the necklace in, in slightly different forms. Um, so in terms of that, I mean, that, that aside from being made slightly smaller, was it altered at all? 
No, stayed the same, just uh, just reduced in number of diamonds, uh, again, just to fit the, the neckline, uh, probably a bit better, um, but otherwise remain the same. Now, one thing that Queen Victoria obviously kind of started the trend of was the, the little dainty crowns. Um, that They've always fascinated me because it, it seems so unlikely for such a, a, a quite, a, quite a, a, a large lady to be wearing such a small kind of headpiece. But obviously that seemed to be, she came up with this idea, didn't she? Yes, it, it turns out that the, the, well, the crown that she's wearing in this picture uh, was slightly bigger, but she had it altered. Um, especially after Prince Albert um, passed away and she was in mourning and she still wanted to wear jewels, but she thought it would be more appropriate to have a smaller crown rather than uh, something very large and, uh, and I want to say magnificent. It's still magnificent, but just less, less of a statement, if you like. So it was almost as, as, a, as a piece in mourning rather than anything else. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so the crown, uh, the crowns are usually made to be very versatile. Um, and this one, for example, could be worn with or without the arches, depending on, on the occasion um, that Queen Victoria was wearing it on. And in this portrait, it has the little arches and very small, only weighed a few hundred grams. No, tremendous, tremendously iconic piece as well for her, for her reign. So now, Aurelia, um, one of the other things that people are often fascinated by um, is the Kokoshnik. Now, what can you tell us about the Kokoshnik tiara? Yeah, Kokoshnik, um, it's one of my favourites, I have to say. Um, it's just, they're all beautiful, but it is really beautiful. Um, this one was made in 1888, again, by Garrard, and it has 61 bars uh, with perfectly matched diamonds. Um, the longest bar measures about six and a half centimetres, and it's named after a traditional Russian headdress, um, therefore called Kokoshnik. And it's, um, it's made uh, in a metal frame with fabric, and it can also be worn as a necklace. On this occasion, it's presented here as a tiara. Um, it was made for under four and a half thousand pounds, which is still a very large amount of money, and presented to Queen Alexandra, um, who was uh, then Princess of Wales, for her 25th wedding anniversary um, on, um, by Lady Salisbury, and it was on behalf of uh, the Ladies of Society, so which was a group of uh, 365 peeresses of the United Kingdom. Um, on her death, um, she present, it was presented to her daughter-in-law, Queen Mary, who then bequeathed it to uh, Queen Elizabeth in 1953. And we have a portrait, a picture, sorry, of, um, of the three wearing that uh, same Kokoshnik tiara. Quick look at this one. Again, it's a timeless piece, isn't it? There we are. And just fits perfectly. You can, you can have it higher on, on your hair. Uh, I was going to say, some, some slightly different styles of wearing it there, and obviously things have changed in terms of fashion. Fashion, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, they're all equally as glamorous. Exactly. So we can see on the left the, the hair is much higher, and therefore the, 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 the crown sits slightly at a different angle. <clears throat> um, and then Queen Elizabeth, we can see it's, it's almost as a bondo, um, still a tiara, but almost fits as a bondo. No, absolutely gorgeous, aren't they? Right, okay. Now, moving on to something else. Um, obviously, we were talking before about Queen Elizabeth's uh, items, and this is another one of them. So what can you tell us about this? A little bit more gentle, but uh, this is, uh, again, something that uh, has an interesting story of, uh, of where it came from, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, so this is um, uh, a wedding present this tiara from the girls of Great Britain and Ireland to the Duchess of York who then became Queen Mary in uh, 1893 again uh, made by Garrard um, and it was then presented to Queen Mary's um, granddaughter Princess Elizabeth and we can see there's a portrait of her wearing it uh, without the the frame and in this case she will be, she's wearing it as a bondo um, so it's slightly less heavy and fits perfectly with the hairstyle of the time in this portrait. No, it's tremendous, isn't it? And again, ever so kind of understatingly glamorous. I say understatingly when, when you've got a, a headpiece that's full of diamonds, but it's not as, as shouty as a traditional crown, shall we say? 
Exactly. So it, you, you can really see the influence of uh, the late 19th century, of the, all the belly puck coming in its, its um, uh, garlands and not, not ribbons in this case, but uh, very delicate um, rather than something very much, much heavier. Um, yes, and, and the frame can therefore be removed and altered again. So, so again, they, they've, they've, they always take that in consideration when making the, um, the jewels and the crowns in particular and tiaras. So that again, it's versatile depending on the fashion, who's wearing it, um, the size and, and all of this and how it needs to be portrayed. Now, the last piece we're going to look at today, and uh, forgive us, ladies and gentlemen, we will, we will be looking at more items from the, the crown jewels, not just the British crown jewels, but uh, of course the French crown jewels as well. But the last thing we're going to be talking about today is something that will have been seen in modern times and on a member of the royal family, but not the one that which you would think. So what can you tell us about this beautiful piece here? So this is Queen Elizabeth's um, halo tiara, um, and it was made by Cartier in 1936. And we can see that it's got that geometric um, <clears throat> influence of the Art Deco, especially on, on the base of the crown, um, almost square and rectangular. It's not, but it looks quite sharp and, and sleek um, and still has some curves. In, in the top of the crown, but remains quite sharp. And that is typical of the, the time in which it was made. And it has almost 740 diamonds in total. So quite, quite a lot of um, uh, carat weight in there again, uh, and, and finesse in making such a piece with so many diamonds. And this one is the one that was recently lent by the queen to Kate Middleton for her wedding. So let's just have a quick look at that image. There so we are. She wears it well, doesn't she? And it suits her dress perfectly with the way, and I'm sure obviously she had the pick of the, uh, the crop in order for which one to wear. Now, just a question on this, because obviously I know you're a big fan of Cartier and I can't pronounce it anywhere near as well as you can or any, um, but what was, the, what was the reasoning, do you think, behind the switch from Garrard to Cartier, or did the royal family use Cartier quite a lot as well? Use Cartier quite a lot. Uh, we see that, especially in, in, in the last century, um, uh, Cartier was one of the go-to jewellers uh, of, the, of the crown and some, spe some specific uh, monarchs. And I think it, this one fits perfectly because uh, Prince Philip really had a close connection with Cartier and had a, a quite a few pieces commissioned for, for the Queen um, by Cartier. And now whether, whether or not he had any influence on, on the creation of this crown, I, I can't, probably not. Well, you, you never, you <laughs> In 1936. <laughs> you never know with the Duke of Edinburgh, bless him. I, I'm sure he probably had a hand in most things in, in, in the royal household during his time. But uh, yes, no, I mean, it, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous piece and it, it suits um, Kate Middleton incredibly well. And obviously, it was you know one of the standout pieces and one of the discussion points of the entire wedding, wasn't it? Exactly, exactly, and it and it fits so perfectly with with the hairstyle. Again, it's so versatile. It can be worn with hair down or up, as, as we see several other times worn by the queen. Um, yeah, very versatile, discreet, but always still a statement. Um, and I think worn perfectly by Kate Middleton there on her day. And and and. and by, you know, supposedly once uh, once Kate Middleton and uh, and Prince William actually ascend the throne that she will inherit and uh, have the ability to wear a lot of the, the jewels that we've actually seen, won't she? Exactly, exactly. So this is belongs to the the crown jewels and therefore she will, she, somebody else from the monarchy will inherit um, the crown and therefore wear it to, on official uh, visits or, or ceremonies and um, uh, as, as she will with other other pieces um, earrings and brooches and rings and, and such not fantastic Aurelia it's been a fascinating talk today thank you ever so much for your time and thank I do look forward to um, I thoroughly look forward to uh, talking about uh, something obviously very 
close to your heart and in, in the French crown jewels in the next one. So thank you ever so much again for your time today. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for joining us again. As I said at the beginning of the webinar, please feel free to get in touch if you'd like us to discuss anything within our webinars, or if you'd like any forms of training for your staff in terms of providing uh, valuations and talking to us about how we can help your business in terms of making sure that your clients are insured properly. So please do get in touch. Uh, so from now, it's many thanks from me and uh, and from Aurelia as well. So thank, thank you, you very much. Have a good day. Cheerio. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.